Hi everyone, this lesson is an introduction into how DNA is replicated. A reminder of the characteristics of life, all living things have to be able to reproduce, and I want us to think of that from a cellular perspective. When cells become damaged, they need to be replaced. The organism that has those cells needs to continue its functioning. Also, when organisms grow or an old cell dies and needs to be replaced, cells can undergo cell division, where one cell can turn into two, two can turn into four. So thinking of this, we want to think about what's required for a cell to reproduce, specifically how it relates to its DNA. If one cell is going to become two, then its DNA is going to need to be replicated. In this diagram to the left, you can see an example of one parent cell becoming two daughter cells. If that parent cell has two chromosomes, structures that contain DNA, notice that each of those daughter cells that are identical each have their own two chromosomes. So I went from two chromosomes to four. So we want to understand how DNA is able to do that, how I'm able to go from 100% of the material to 200%, how one double helix can become two. A reminder from the discovery of DNA, the work of Melson and Stahl confirmed one of the three popular theoretical models on how DNA replicates. Specifically, one model was that DNA replication is conservative, that the original parent strand remains the same, and all replicated DNA is made out of new material, or the semi-conservative model where the parent strand is split and it is conserved with one old strand and one new, or the dispersive model where DNA is sporadically broken and rebuilt. Their research using heavy nitrogen isotopes showed that the semi-conservative model is the one that actually is occurring in cells. Specifically, when DNA is copied, we have our original parent strand, which is going to act as a template for the new strands that will be built upon them. This is a semi-conservative process. That parental strand is split open, one old strand remains, the dark blue in this diagram, and one new strand, the light blue, is built using the rules of base pairing. When DNA is bonding together, there's two types of bonds we want to be mindful of. When nucleic acids are bonding together, it is a hydrogen bond that is bonding them together. These are very weak bonds that can be rapidly broken and rebuilt. When looking at individual nucleotides, it's a phosphodiester bond that is building them together. And that bond is covalent, so it's very, very sturdy. It is not going to rapidly be broken. And a reminder of our base pairing rules. When the two strands of DNA are combining by hydrogen bonds, adenines will always bind to thymines, and it's only two hydrogen bonds that form when that occurs. Whereas with a cytosine and a guanine, it is three hydrogen bonds that are holding them together. As we go through how DNA replicates, it's important now to keep in mind the directionality of DNA, or what carbon is pointing where. A reminder of how to count carbons. You begin with your carbon ring. We're going to look at ribose in this example. You start at the northernmost carbon and move in a clockwise pattern. Since our northernmost molecule at this point is an oxygen, we're going to start to the right. So that'll be our first or one prime carbon. And then we'll move clockwise. So there's two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. For the purposes of this lesson, knowing if we're dealing with five prime or three prime is going to be particularly important. Here's why. When we're building that phosphodiester backbone, that phosphate sugar backbone, we always want to refer to what is pointing up or pointing down for the last carbon on either end of the DNA molecule. So in this example with two nucleotides, you can see that the five prime carbon is pointing up. So we're going to refer to that end as five prime. And the three prime carbon on the last nucleotide is pointing down. So we'll refer to that as the three prime end. The nucleotides in the DNA backbone are going to be bound together so that one strand is pointing one direction and another strand is pointing the other. Here's what I mean by that. Looking at the strand on the left, you'll notice the five prime carbons pointing up and the three prime carbons pointing down. Now look at the strand on the right. It's been flipped. In this instance, the three prime carbons pointing up and the five prime carbons pointing down. This is what we mean by DNA being anti-parallel. The two strands run parallel to each other, but one is flipped to the opposite orientation. Now imagine there's only one strand there. If we're going to build a new one, knowing what direction we are adding to and what direction we're building in now becomes very important. So before we jump into everything involved with DNA replication, it is a large team of enzymes that are going to have to coordinate to pull 
this off. Our challenge is to know what these enzymes are and the function of each when replicating DNA. Here's what DNA replication looks like under the microscope. Notice that DNA is not replicated from one end and just builds all the way down. Instead, DNA replicates from multiple points called origins of replication, and it builds in each direction. When this happens, it forms a bubble and creates little forks that we call replication forks. Why is this the case? Well, DNA is huge. It's massive. It would take way too long to replicate DNA from one end to the other. So instead, we build at multiple different points. The bubbles build in each direction. Those bubbles expand out, and when they collide, we now have two new DNA molecules. So our first step here, I'm going to speak generally, and then we'll get more specific, is we just need to open up the double helix to build a new strand. The enzyme that's going to unwind DNA is known as DNA helicase. Notice that DNA helicase is on both ends of the bubble. We're always building in both directions. Helicase is going to go in and unwind or unzip the genes, unzip the DNA double helix. Now, when breaking those hydrogen bonds, with her, which are weak, the DNA double helix actually wants to collapse back down on itself. To prevent that from happening, Proteins called single-stranded binding proteins will attach to the outer portions of the DNA strands and hold them open so that we have space for creating a new DNA strand. And again, at each end, we refer to this as a replication fork. It's like a fork in the road, and we have it on both ends of our bubble. So the next step is build the new strand. You can see here on the left-hand side, I've got a DNA strand. I have five prime pointing up. 3' prime pointing down. To add new complementary bases, we're going to use an enzyme called DNA polymerase 3. DNA polymerase 3 is going to come in and add new base pairs according to the base pairing rules. So here you can see guanines being attached to cytosine, adenines being attached to thymine, cytosines being attached to guanine, and so on. And again, notice those ends. Notice that here 5' primes pointing down, the opposite of the parent strand we're building on. Now, this isn't going to happen for free. The energy to build a new DNA double helix is going to have to come from somewhere. So where do we get it? Well, let's look at ATP. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, has three phosphates, phosphates that can be used to harvest energy for cellular work. If I break off one of those phosphates, I now have an ADP or adenosine diphosphate. Let's say I break off another. Now I have an AMP or an adenosine monophosphate. That's an adenosine nucleotide. By breaking the phosphate bonds off of an ATP, this can provide DNA polymerase the energy it needs to attach nucleotides when building a new DNA strand. Now, that's not only true for adenine. Guanine has a triphosphate form as well that can provide energy during DNA replication. So does thymine. Thymine can be TTP. And cytosine has a triphosphate form. So does these triphosphate forms of the nucleotides that are providing the energy we need. So let's put this all together. I have my parental strand on the right, this time three primes pointing up, five primes pointing down, and let's build a new complementary strand per the semi-conservative model. Well, helicase has already opened the double helix in this case, so now polymerase three is gonna come in and attach new nucleotides to complementary base pairs. Where does it get the energy? Well, you can see this is an ATP, so polymerase breaks off those two phosphates and uses that energy to form the phosphodiester bond. Now it does the same for guanine, for thymine, and so on. Now, this is a simplified model of DNA replication. It's not actually what happens. So let's add a little more sophistication to our model. DNA polymerase 3 has a major problem. Polymerase 3 can only build in one direction and in only one way. Specifically, polymerase 3 can only build if it has a primer to attach to, it needs a double strand to begin building off of, and most importantly, it can only build in the 5 to 3 prime direction. What I mean by this is you can see the strand that's being built goes from 5 to 3. Polymerase cannot build in the opposite direction, it cannot attach to this 5 prime end and build outward. Problem is, DNA needs to be able to build in both directions. We're building bubbles here. We need to build to the right 
in the left. So because DNA polymerase 3 can only build in one direction, that makes the specifics of DNA replication a little more complicated. So first I'm going to show you an animation of everything happening at once, and then we'll jump into the specifics. DNA is a molecule made up of two strands, twisted around each other in a double helix shape. Each strand is made up of a sequence of four chemical bases, represented by the letters A, C, G, and T. The two strands are complementary. This means that wherever there's a T in one strand, there will be an A in the opposite strand, and wherever there's a C, there will be a G in the other strand. Each strand has a 5' prime end and a 3' prime end. The two strands run in opposite directions. This determines how each strand of DNA is replicated. The first step in DNA replication is to separate the two strands. This unzipping is done by an enzyme called helicase and results in the formation of a replication fork. The separated strands each provide a template for creating a new strand of DNA. An enzyme called primase starts the process. This enzyme makes a small piece of RNA called a primer. This marks the starting point for the construction of the new strand of DNA. An enzyme called DNA polymerase binds to the primer and will make the new strand of DNA. DNA polymerase can only add DNA bases in one direction, from the 5' prime end to the 3' prime end. One of the new strands of DNA, the leading strand, is made continuously the DNA polymerase adding bases one by one in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The other strand, the lagging strand, cannot be made in this continuous way because it runs in the opposite direction. The DNA polymerase can therefore only make this strand in a series of small chunks called Okazaki fragments. Each fragment is started with an RNA primer. DNA polymerase then adds a short row of DNA bases in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. The next primer is then added further down the lagging strand. Another Okazaki fragment is then made, and the process is repeated again. Once the new DNA has been made, the enzyme exonuclease removes all the RNA primers from both strands of DNA. Another DNA polymerase enzyme then fills in the gaps that are left behind with DNA. Finally, the enzyme DNA ligase seals up the fragments of DNA in both strands to form a continuous double strand. DNA replication is described as semi-conservative because each DNA molecule is made up of one old, conserved strand of DNA and one new one. As you saw in the video, DNA replication occurs differently based on which end you're building, if you're building on what we call the leading strand or the lagging strand. Let's look at that again. So here, I'm showing one end of my replication bubble. Again, it's happening on both ends. So I need to open the double helix. DNA helicase is going to do that. I'm going to keep it open with single-stranded binding proteins. And it's going to continue to build in this direction. While you're looking at a static image, remember it continues to build. Helicase continues to unzip. So on the top, I have a 5' prime end. On the bottom, a 3' prime end. So here comes DNA polymerase 3 to build a new strand. Well, polymerase 3 can attach to the 3' prime end on the bottom and build outward towards the fork. This strand will just continuously build. On the other end, however, DNA polymerase cannot build towards the 5' prime direction, so it's going to have to build in the opposite direction. Problem is, this strand's continuing to unfold, so now I have a gap here that isn't being replicated by DNA polymerase 3. So overcome that problem, polymerase 3 is going to build in chunks. It'll attach, build a small section of DNA, move off, and then attach behind that and continue onward. This is the limit of polymerase 3. It can only build a strand from 5 to 3. 
These chunks that are built are called Okazaki fragments, and they're named that after Okazaki, the scientist who discovered them. Now we can't have open chunks in our DNA. We can't have these fragments not be continuous. So an enzyme called DNA ligase will actually come in and glue those chunks together. Think of DNA ligase as DNA glue. This strand on the bottom that's building continuously towards the replication fork, we call the leading strand because it's gonna build the fastest. It doesn't have to build in chunks. It's just a continuous synthesis. Whereas on the other end, we refer to it as being the lagging strand because it's gonna take more time to build those fragments out. Again, the lagging strand is made up of Okazaki fragments and is joined together by DNA ligase, the DNA glue. To look at this from far away, I mentioned to you that one end is a leading strand and one end is a lagging strand. So if we look at that end of the bubble here, this time the leading strand's on the top and the lagging strand's gonna be on the bottom. But we have to think of the whole picture. As these lagging strands build out towards the other replication fork, they're no longer gonna have this directionality problem. They'll actually begin to become the leading strand on the other end of the bubble because now they're building in the direction towards the fork. The opposite is true for the leading strand on the top. Even though it's leading here, its origins was actually lagging because of this directionality problem within the replication bubble. Now, this gets a little more complicated. I, met, I told you two problems with DNA polymerase three. One is it can only build a strand that goes five to three. The other is it has to attach to a primer. So here's how those primers are attached. There's an enzyme called primase. And what primase will do is build a small section of RNA. That RNA is the starting point for DNA polymerase three to attach and begin building. You can see that here on the leading strand, and primase does the same thing on the lagging strand. It's gonna drop a primer every single one of those Okazaki fragments. Now, this creates a new problem. Yay, I have primers, I can replicate my DNA, but I wanna replicate DNA. I don't want a strand that's made of RNA and DNA. That's not gonna work. So to get rid of this RNA, we're gonna use another enzyme called DNA polymerase one. One of the functions of DNA polymerase one is to go in and replace those RNA primers with DNA nucleotides. After that's replaced, ligase can then fuse everything together, and now I have strands made only of DNA. Awesome. But here's another problem. DNA polymerase is a polymerase, meaning it can only build five to three. So what's gonna happen with this fragment here? Well, it's gonna stay blank. It can't be replaced. That's not good. The last thing you want is to lose your DNA, the very blueprint for all of the traits that make up you. This is what we refer to as chromosome erosion. Because of the directionality that polymerase one can build into, every single time there's a replication, that means the ends get shorter on the five prime end. That means you're losing DNA with every single replication. That's not good. If you start losing important DNA, your cell can no longer reproduce. Fortunately, you have a built-in backup system to protect you from this at least some of the time. At the end of your chromosomes are things called telomeres. Telomeres are repeating sequences that code for absolutely nothing. They're just repeating gibberish again and again and again. Why is that there? Well, if you lose this protective gibberish at the end, whatever. It's not important. It doesn't code for anything. You're not effective with your DNA replication. But you only have enough for about 50 replications. You do more than 50 replications, you start losing important DNA. And that's actually one of the current theories of why we age. The thinking is, as you get older, your cells reproduce more, they lose their telomeres, and they start to make mistakes when they replicate because they are now losing important information at the five prime end. Turns out though, there is an enzyme that can replace telomeres, and it's called telomerase. Telomerase can build in that other direction and extend your telomeres so that you don't lose DNA after those 50 replications. The problem is, it has great variation in cell types. Most cells don't have any telomerase, and if they do, it's a very small amount. Unless you're a stem cell or a cancer cell. Cancer cells have telomerase in very high amounts. We actually have cancer cells on ice that have been alive for more than 100 years and their DNA is perfectly intact because of their telomerase. Why do stem cells and cancer have so much? 
We don't really know. But if we figure that out, perhaps we could turn it off of cancer cells and cause them to age and die. And conversely, perhaps we could turn it on in our cells so that we continue to have a lot of telomerase so that we don't experience aging if that theory is true. More science needs to be done. So let's review all of this. Here you can see one end of our replication bubble, so one replication fork. Our DNA double helix was opened by helicase. Single-stranding binding proteins kept the double helix open. Primase came in and dropped RNA primers. Those RNA primers gave DNA polymerase 3 a starting point to replicate. Notice on our bottom strand here, DNA polymerase 3 is able to build a strand from 5 to 3 towards the fork, so that's going to be our leading strand. But on the top here, we are dealing with fragments. We are building in the opposite direction, so instead we're going to form Okazaki fragments, fragments that will be glued together by DNA ligase, and replaced by DNA polymerase 1. Polymerase 1 will replace those RNA primers with DNA. And that's it for DNA replication. One last note before we end. If you're going to be making thousands of base pairs per second, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. No system is perfect. And mistakes happen all the time in DNA replication. Sometimes polymerase 3 will drop an adenine instead of a thymine. To correct this, DNA polymerase 1 will actually proofread the DNA, and if it finds any misapplication, it will cut it out and replace it. Sometimes these are referred to as endonucleases, if you see that phrase. This works most of the time, and this keeps our DNA from being riddled with typos. But there are instances where DNA polymerase 1 doesn't catch the mistake, and those will be damages or mutations that can stay with you throughout your life if it's not caught. So what does DNA replication really look like? Here you can see a bird's eye view, well, a microscopic view of all those replication bubbles forming and colliding. And in cells, you can actually see chromosomes appear and be torn apart and replicated. I hope this was a helpful introduction to DNA replication, and I'll see you next time.